Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Orchard. My name is Wes, and I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, I'm a new guy, so uh, too tall to be Will, too much hair to be Brian. Um, I'm brand new, uh, and uh, we, we've been here for about two months, and we're absolutely loving it, and you guys have done such a good, good job of making us feel at home here at the Orchard, um, Tupelo. So today we are continuing on uh, and finishing up our series called Flourish, and Flourish is a series on the book of Deuteronomy. So if you have your Bibles and you want to go to the book of Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand. We have people all around the room who are going to be walking around, and they have a Bible to give you to look on this morning if you need to look on a Bible. If you don't have a Bible that you find really readable and understandable, we would love for you to take one of these Bibles as a gift from us to you because the, the Bible is a transformative word of God, and everyone needs to have it. If you know somebody, you're trying to reach out to, uh, to somebody with the gospel and you want to give them a Bible, we would love for you to take one of those for that reason as well. So this series is called Flourish because we've been looking at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is kind of a summary of uh, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, all these things of, of Israel escaping from the land of Egypt, God giving them the law, and wandering in the wilderness. And right, bef- right before they're going into the, the promised land that God has given them, they are uh, there to read this law again. It's the second telling of the law. This is Moses giving a speech, basically like, hey, we're about to go in, and it's really important that we do all these things that God has commanded us to do. If we do the things that God has commanded us to do, we will flourish in the land. If we don't do the things that God has commanded us to do, then we will struggle in the land, and it will be taken from us. If you read chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, it really summarizes what we've been saying the last two weeks. These are the commands, decrees, regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy, and you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you will live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. So if you want to go more in depth on the blessings of following the covenant and the curses that come along if we don't follow the covenant and the rules and you can look at Deuteronomy 28 it really just spe- it just spells out this is the good stuff that's going to happen if you are righteous and follow God and do what he says here are the bad things that are going to happen if you don't but the the worst thing that could happen is that the land will be, have drought and famine and I will allow other nations to come in and take the land from you and take you away from the land as slaves And so we've been looking at this uh, from the perspective of our own lives, wanting to live a life that flourishes, wanting to live a life in the land, in our homes and in our work and everything that we do, a life that that flourishes, that is blessed by God. Um, And this is uh, Deuteronomy, we really feel like is the way that we can orient our lives in the right direction, orient our lives around God, ensuring that our lives will flourish because our hearts will be set on him. What, what we were made to be as people who worship God, our hearts will be set on him. But it's really, really, really easy to forget the point. If you're anything like me, then you are really forgetful. I'm, I am that person that if my head wasn't attached to my body, then I would have left it at home already. Uh, that, that's just who I am. But I actually looked and saw that studies are saying that we are getting more and more forgetful as a people. So if being forgetful resonates with you, there's probably a reason why. We are becoming more and more forgetful as a people, and the two main culprits are technology and multitasking. Those are the reasons why we have such a hard time prioritizing and remembering things that we need to remember because we're on our phones so often, so distracted by technology, and we are always trying to do multiple things at one time. We are so scattered in all the things that we have to do all the time. It's really easy to forget what things are important and to not make the main things, the most important things, the the main thing in our lives. And so we're so scattered around everywhere And God knows that we're like this. God knows that we have a tendency to forget. And that's why we have verses 6, chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. This is what we call the Shema. And it is 
the most important verse, uh, six and five, most important verses in the Old Testament, verses, excuse me, four and five. It says this, listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. So before we go into the promised land, before we start to to set up tent there and set up our lives there, we have to make sure that we remember these two things, the greatest command, Jesus says in Matthew 22. The the most important thing, and that that first part is listen to Israel. We we call it the Shema. It's been called the Shema throughout time because the the Hebrew word for listen is the word Shema. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. This is the declaration that there is one God. And the one God, the one supreme God of the universe is our God, Yahweh. And they, we use the name Yahweh because that was the name that God told Moses when, when Moses says, hey, when you send me, who am I supposed to say to the people of Israel that, that is sending me? And he says that his name is Yahweh. It means I am. That is his name. And so there is one God in the universe, and that God is our God, Yahweh, the God who saved us miraculously from Egypt. That is the one true God of the universe. There are no other gods besides him. And this is revolutionary in the ancient world. What we call this now is monotheism, the belief in one God. But nobody was monotheistic at this time. Nobody believed in one God. All the nations around them had their own God. There were a plurality of gods everywhere. And the nation that they were going into, the the land of Canaan, what will become Israel, this land is filled with many, many different tribes and nations. And each one of these tribes and nations has their own God. And they, every time they would go into battle with one another, they, it would be to them like, our God is going against your God in battle, and whoever wins, whoever wins the battle, their, their God is the supreme, victorious God. And it's so important for the people of Israel to know going into a situation like this that there is only one God. And people would worship these multiple gods for other different reasons because idolatry, all idolatry really is, is it is a reflection of our own selfish inner wants and desires. And so you would worship the God of one country because that was the God of the harvest. So if you wanted to ensure that you got a lot of rain and had a good harvest, you would sacrifice and worship to that God. Or another God would be the God of fertility. So if you wanted to ensure that you would have many children, then you would sacrifice and worship to that God. But it's in this world view that they're about to enter that the proclamation is there is one supreme God, only one that you need to go to for everything. And that is our God Yahweh. I don't think that the worry is so much that the people of Israel would completely stop worshiping Yahweh altogether, but that he would become just another God in the pantheon. Like you'd still go to church, you'd still worship Jesus, you'd still, you'd still do what you gotta do on Sunday, but then the rest of your life, you're still worshiping all the other gods out there. That is what Deuteronomy is trying to ward us against. And the second part of the command is just as important, verse 5, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. It's not good enough just to know that there's one God and Yahweh is his name, the one God of the universe, but we have to love God with our whole being, everything that we are, all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our strength. And in this ancient understanding of who we are, this is the totality of our being. Your heart is your innermost self. Your heart is the executive center of who you are. And whatever you love the most in life, that is what's going to guide your decision making. That's going to shape your personality, and it's going to shape where you spend all of your energy, whatever you love. That's the reason why Jesus says your heart is where your treasure lies. The second part of our being, our soul, that's your personality. That's who God has made you to be. That's your your individual footprint. It's the the non-physical part of who you are. It's what makes you, you. There's never been you before, and there never will be in the future. 
And what we love is, shapes our personality and who we are. And then lastly, your strength. That's the energy that your body has. And we all know that we all have a finite amount of energy in our bodies as part of being human is we're not all powerful, that we work, but we have to rest, and we have to maintain that kind of balance. But what we spend our energy on, what we, that vitality and that life that we have, what we spend that on is a direct reflection of what our heart chases after. And you can really... To, to figure out where your heart lies, you can really do a practice where you can look at your energy and where you spend all of your time, where you devote most of your time and energy and go backwards and that is where your heart is. So you might think, well, you know, I, I don't have any idols. There's, there's nothing really in my life that I'm, I'm worshiping and loving besides, uh, besides Jesus because, you know, we don't, we don't have like idols made of stone and wood and things like that. Um, but wherever your heart is, if that's other than Jesus, then that's an idol. And if you look at your life and your strength and your energy, and if you're spending all of your energy on these other things and have no time to worship the one true God, then you have an idol problem. And that idol has your life and is shaping your soul and shaping your, the love of your heart. Uh, to put this into like practice and see it in a normal life, uh, I, I'll give you an example from me. Now, I would have called myself, um, uh, for most of my life, I, I labeled myself an avid indoorsman. Um, that means that I really didn't like to uh, get up from the couch or air conditioning or anything like that. I liked to be inside, and that was what was comfortable for me. I grew up uh, in, in a city, and then I, ha I should have confessed this earlier, I'm from Ohio, um, so I am a Yankee. I'm really sorry. Um, you can leave now if that uh, is a problem. Um, but I, I, I grew up just being an indoors kind of city boy kind of person. Um, and it was always really hilarious when I uh, started dating and married my wife, who is from Carthage, Mississippi. And, and saying Carthage is even really kind. She's from the suburb of Carthage, uh, Edinburgh, uh, Mississippi. So kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, but I'll tell you, one of the things I learned really quick going and visiting my wife and her family is they loved to deer hunt. They loved it so much. And every Christmas we would have these white elephant, uh, dirty Santa uh, Christmas parties where you would randomly bring a gift. And I had two options if I was going to be at this dirty Santa every single year. And that was that I either got a really, really girly gift from one of the women or I got something related to hunting. And because everyone knew that I didn't hunt, it was the funniest thing in the world to my wife's family when I would open up a package and there was dough urine inside the package. I was not sure what to do with this when I got it. Uh, or another time, I swear, I got a Bowie knife this long. I mean, just a giant knife. And I just thought, I can spread butter on toast with this. That, that's pretty much, that's pretty much what, what this would be useful for for me. But... Uh, a couple years later, I finally gave in and went with my uh, father-in-law hunting, and I killed my first deer, and then it was like I was hooked. I mean, my heart was like, this is the greatest thing ever. Uh, and I started, like, getting all into the outdoors. I got so into hunting, and it, it really it started to, to, like, shape my personality and who I was. I, I started uh, talking more like a hunter. Um, I started thinking, you know what? Camo can go with everything. You know, that, that's really what I need. I need, I need to ha accessorize with some camo at, at all times. I started buying things, and then that's where all of my strength and my energy started to go. When I had free time, I wanted to be in the woods, and I wanted to hunt. And my wife can, can verify that for you. She's already started the conversation about this fall. You know, you're not going to hunt as much this year as you have in the past, right? Like she's already uh, preparing me for the, the no's that are gonna be coming um, here pretty soon. But it, it just, it started to shape all of who I was and that's how these practices work is you do these things and, you be, it, and they, they train your heart and they, you begin to love these things that you do. It starts to shape your personality and the very essence of who you are and then that's where all of your time and energy goes through. And that, that's what, what hunting um, had, had become for me and has become for me. And because we're so prone to this, that's why we have the Shema to remind us, but that's also why we have a number of practices that Deuteronomy gives us here, starting in verse 6. 
It says, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you're on the road and when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them to your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Basically, surround yourself with this command to lo- that, that there's one God and you are to love him and, and, and make it everywhere so that you will not forget. And not just that you won't forget, as we're so prone to do, but as you practice these things, as you submit yourself to these practices, these practices shape us. Because when we remember daily there's one God and submit to his kingship when we pray, when we read the word, when we do these things, it shapes our hearts towards God to love him instead of these other things that we have going on. And that's exactly what it's telling us to do here. Repeat them and again and again to your children, it says. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, and when you're getting up. Today, to this day, people, the people of Israel, the people who worship Yahweh, they will recite the Shema three times a day. They do it when they get up in the morning, they do it at midday, and they do it in the evening. If you, if you, I've had Will verify all these things because he's been to Israel so many times that people still do this to this day, practicing these very commands because they know it's so central to their faith and who they are and how they follow Jesus. And so one of the things that I did as I practiced to try to help myself remember that there's one God because I can forget pretty easily every day is that I started to set my alarm for three times a day. So in the morning, I would set my alarm uh, and then at lunchtime and in the evening right around dinner. And, and it would make me stop in my day because, you know, you want to get up and get going and get into all of your stuff. And it would make me stop in my day. And I, I kind of augmented the Shema that for me it would say, hear, O oh my soul, there is one king and Jesus is his name. Because that reminded me all day long that there's one God and king and it's not me. It's not me. And I needed that reminder. How often my alarm went off to pray and I was in the middle of something that I thought was important and I didn't want to stop to pray. That's why it's a discipline and that's why it's intentional and we do it to remind us that what we're doing at that moment is not more important than who the one true king is in our life. It also says in verse 8, tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. People would literally, they took this so literally that they would actually tie boxes of scripture to their head and to their hands as a, as a reminder um, and, and actually doing this to the letter of the law. They call them uh, phylacteries. Here's a picture we have of someone wearing these. You see this man has that little box on his forehead has scripture, has Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 written and put inside there. And you can see the, the box on his bicep as well. That is to take this literally. And again, if you go to Israel, you will see people wearing this very thing all around. And now we're not going to ask you to tie scripture to your forehead and to your arm. Um, but what we should be people that are so engrossed in the word of God that it has shaped our mindset, it has shaped our heart, and we then have a biblical worldview, that we don't look at the world the same way as everyone else does, but we look at the world through the way who the Bible tells us we are and how we are to treat others. That the Bible should just kind of be like part of our DNA and who we are. It should be something where we're in daily or as often as we can be. Because the Bible is the living and active word of God and the Holy Spirit speaks to us, convicts us, and guides us through it. The main way that God has spoken to me most in my life has been through reading the word of God. And so it needs to be on our minds and in our hearts at all times. Then it says in verse 9, write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gate. And they, this is another literal practice, these things called mezuzahs, where they would take a little box like you saw on the man, and they would literally nail them above doorposts in their house and on their gate. And the point is to say that, that for me in my house, for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And you see all these, what it said earlier on in, in verse 7, repeat them again and again to your children to ensure that not just the first generation thrives in the land, but generation after generation thrives in the land, that we have to teach our children and disciple our children. 
that these practices that we are developing for ourselves and that we intentionally put into our lives, we have to intentionally invite our children to be a part of them too. So if you're praying and you're reading the word of God or you're serving other people, then those are things we need to invite our children to be part of too because parenting is the purest form of discipleship that there is. Your children are going to look to you all the good and all the bad. They just kind of absorb it through osmosis. And all too often, we we really want to farm out uh, the discipleship of our children to to church. And and it's great. We want to be able to come alongside you and partner you. but but, But you need to be the main discipling factor in your children's life because you are more influential to them than anybody else. So that they, as, as we have thrived in our relationship with Christ, that we would grow them up to be people who would thrive in their relationship with Jesus and flourish because of what we've taught them. I, I want my child, both my children, I want them to be, to be more devoted followers of Jesus than I am. I want them to do and have a greater impact on the kingdom of God than I have had to teach them to do that, and I don't always do a good job of it, but to teach them to do these things. Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, this, the Shema, it exists to completely revolutionize our heart and lives as followers of Jesus, people thousands of years ago who are following Jesus, going into the promised land, and people like us who are ushering into this world the promised land, God's kingdom come on earth in Tupelo as it is in heaven, that God is using us to bring flourishing and life to this world. But in order to do that, he has to have all of us. He has to have your whole heart, your whole soul, and your whole strength. He wants the totality of who you are. We need a revolution of our heart and mind. There was this guy um, a long time ago named Copernicus, and before uh, Copernicus, everyone believed that we were the center of the universe, that Earth was the center of the universe, and the sun and all the planets revolved around the Earth. In our human nature, who we are as, as people born into sin, that is the way we normally operate. We believe we are the center of the universe. So all of our heart's desires, all of our practices revolves around us because I'm the center of the world. We need that kind of Copernican revolution in our hearts. We are not the center of the universe. God is. Jesus is the center of the universe. In everything you do, all your practices, your heart, soul, and strength all have to revolve around him. They need to revolve around him. That's the only way to flourish. So if your life feels like you're running on empty, if your life feels like you're distracted and in so many different places, it's probably because you, your life is scattered and your life is not focused on the one true God. And so we need practices in our life that will remind us that there is one God, but that will also teach us to love him. I started uh, running back in February, and man, when I, when I first started running, I couldn't go very far. I had to like walk most of the time. I hated it. It was like the worst thing ever. I was like, why am I doing this? Why do I get up and do this? But then as I kept at it and I kept going, I started to really like it, and it started to kind of become just a part of my everyday routine and part of my life, and it, it kind of started to become part of my, my uh, reality, and I, I started to really love it. And that is so much what uh, our daily practices of following Jesus can be like. At first, it can seem like really overwhelming and unnatural and just not part of who I am. But the more we do these things, the more we say no to ourselves and die to ourselves, the more room we give for the Holy Spirit to come and shape our heart, mind, soul, and strength so that we live and act like Jesus. And that is what flourishing looks like. For God to be the center of your universe. That is what flourishing looks like. So I want to give you uh, a few practices that I want you to try out this week. 
And again, at first, they might seem completely foreign and crazy, but I I promise you, if you do these things and you continue to do these practices and and you can shape them to kind of fit your life and and fit your walk with Jesus, but if you do these kinds of practices, then I promise you that will open up a way for the Spirit of God to start transforming you from the inside out. So here, here are four things that you could try to do this week. Number one is commit an act of kindness for an enemy. And it might not have to be an enemy. Uh, maybe some of you don't have enemies. Um, don't, don't raise your hand or anything. Um, but to, to commit an act of kindness for someone, there's actually a discipline called secrecy. And that's when you do something really good for somebody, but you don't tell them or anybody else that you did it. Because it's one thing to do something good for somebody, but then it's really good to pat yourself on the back because you did something good for somebody. But what if, what if you uh, did something good for someone, uh, just bless them um, for no other reason, even just to, to ask God to show someone, uh, to bring someone into your mental space that, that you should go and you should bless and not tell anybody about it. The second thing is to say no or to fast from something that saps your energy and to give that energy to God instead. Uh, the iPhone, um, I mean, how much time do we waste on our phones how much time do, I mean, and that's one of the reasons why we're so scattered in the first place. But whatever thing it is, it, it, like if it was like hunting for me for a long time, like, hey, maybe it's, this isn't good because it's, it's starting to shape who I am. I'm, I'm too into this thing. Um, number three is to read a psalm every day and meditate on the meaning, on its meaning for your life. So to, to pray before you read the psalm, ask God to open your heart and mind and even pray the words of the psalm uh, and, and, the, and, and just have that kind of soak into you who you are and your identity. Um, and then the last one is to sit in silent prayer and ask for the Holy Spirit to speak to you, to pray. I often feel that how much we pray is a great indicator of how much we're depending on God in our lives. So to pray, I know it's going to be weird, it's going to be uncomfortable. And, but, but I promise you, as you keep at it and you wait for the presence of God, I promise you that the Holy Spirit will speak to you, that the Holy Spirit will love you, that the Holy Spirit will start shaping you into the image of Jesus. I don't think the issue for any of us here is that we don't worship Jesus. You're here, right, on a Sunday morning. I think the, 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 the issue is, is Jesus just another God and the pantheon of gods in our life. So as we close, if, if the Lord's brought you that conviction this morning, then I think it's a great time to purge ourselves of our idols, to repent, to cast our idols out of our lives, to come to the altar and, and ask God for forgiveness, but then also to, to love God with our heart and start implementing into our lives practices that'll teach us to love him more and more and more. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful that even though we mess up so often, that we fail so often, that our hearts wander so much that you are always there with open arms to love us. And and God, as we repent of our idols, as we run to you this morning, we pray that you would replace the idols in our hearts with your spirit that we wouldn't feel shame, but we would feel your love and acceptance as we run to your arms this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.